Our project was about the CO2 uh, membrane separation at the rawhide coal-powered energy plant. Our project is to develop a post-combustion membrane system that would capture the CO2 released from the rawhide power plant located in Wellington, Colorado. The scope of our project is to develop an economically viable process while still maintaining our environmental goals. As carbon dioxide is a high contributor to greenhouse gases, also known as GHGs, eliminating the release of CO2 in post-combustion will greatly decrease the environmental impact of the rawhide power plants. Finding efficient methods that reduce the amount of energy required to operate large-scale membrane separation systems, and also developing a process in which the cost of operation is low while the recovery of CO2 is high were the two main goals for our project. As greenhouse gases are a growing concern worldwide, since they contribute to climate change, it is very important to develop processes that both meet the energy demand of the world, as well as prevent further global warming from occurring. The primary motivation for this system was to reduce greenhouse gas emissions at a cost that is feasible for the Warahide power plant to implement. CO2 is the primary pollutant responsible for global warming, climate change, and the depletion of the ozone layer in the Earth's atmosphere. In order to begin the process of balancing the concentration of chemical species in the atmosphere, CO2 and the combustion gases must no longer be emitted into it. With the prospect of a large tax on carbon emissions in the upcoming years, CO2 removal technology will be in high demand for industries that produce large amounts of CO2, such as coal-fired power plants like Rawhide. It is speculated that such industries will not be able to survive and make a profit once the carbon tax is introduced. The goal is to cut carbon emissions to zero, but separation technology could greatly help the transition to renewable power sources from traditional ones. As mentioned previously, a carbon tax has been proposed that is expected to reach $50 per ton of CO2 emitted by the year 2030. Compared with the analysis of the price per kilogram of CO2 removed for this system, CO2 will be removed for roughly $72 a ton, which would result in a net cost of $22 per ton of CO2 produced, compared to a net cost of just paying the tax and releasing more CO2 into the environment. Captured CO2 can also be potentially sold to companies that utilize a lot of the compound, such as soda production companies. The system could also save the rawhide plant about $28 per ton CO2 in combat air pollution, as well as extend the longevity of the plant and its workers by emitting less harmful aerosols. Many considerations had to be taken into account to design an optimal system for CO2 recovery at Rawhide. First, the plant must have the lowest operating cost with the highest possible percent recovery in order to maximize economic efficiency. This also means that the energy needed to run the plant must be minimized as well and considered while making the model. The CO2 being collected must be a very high purity product in addition to being procured in an inexpensive manner in order to guarantee that companies wanting to use CO2 will be willing to purchase this recaptured CO2 product. So the bottom line of this is maximize the recovery and minimize the costs. This synthesis tree walks through the design choices we made for our model. The first steps were to look at the membrane material and the type of membrane. The type of membrane we decided would work best is a hollow fiber membrane. This is a type that consists of several small tubes that gas can pass through, each surrounded by membrane. The membrane type affects how well the gases can be separated. And the one we chose specifically is the Polaris membrane, which is commercially available, made by Membrane Technology and Research Incorporated. The next few steps looked at the design and operation of the membrane units themselves. The number of membrane units affects the quality of the separation in the end. More membranes will give a more CO2 separation, but will also require substantially more membrane area, which will not only add to the membrane cost initially, but also to the operating costs to use the membranes. 
we decided that two membrane units could give enough separation to have a high purity product of almost 90% uh, CO2, as well as keeping the operating costs as low as possible. The pressure difference between the feed and permeate stream is important because it is the driving force that causes CO2 to separate across a membrane. Compressors raise the pressure of the feed while vacuum pumps lower the pressure of the permeate. We chose to use both because it allows for greater pressure difference as well as reduces electricity costs as compressors alone are extremely expensive to both purchase and run at high pressures. The final consideration we took into account was a sweep gas, which would have helped the permeate to flow through the system. This could have improved the separation, but we chose not to use a sweep gas as it would only complicate the model. So here is our first basic process synthesis chart. So as we can see, the flue gas, which is entering on the far left, that comes directly from our combusted coal from the power plant. So that is just straight out of the power plant, the inlet to this system. It is instantly put into a compressor in order to raise the pressure of the stream and then fed through a membrane that has a vacuum pump on the bottom in order to pull uh, the CO2 permeate out of the stream and leave the uh, nitrogen retentate coming out of the top of the membrane. Um, the permeate streams should all have a very high CO2 concentration, whereas all the retentate streams are the waste streams for our system, and assuming the binary mixture as we did, the retentates will have very high nitrogen concentrations. And our final product stream coming out of the second membrane's vacuum pump, that should be very high percent CO2. When approaching modeling and calculations, some assumptions must be made. Upon looking at the annual emissions for the rawhide power plant, the NOx and SOx concentrations were low enough to be considered negligible. We also decided to ignore any oxygen or water that could be present in the flue gas, meaning that we treated the flue gas, as mentioned earlier, as a binary mixture of only CO2 and N2. Many studies, in addition to our own, also assumed binary mixture for flue gas membrane separations. Some other assumptions were made to simplify the calculations when modeling the membranes as well. The membrane permeate was assumed to be well mixed and the membrane properties were assumed to be constant. It was also assumed that there was no pressure drop on the feed side of the membrane. We modeled our membrane system in a simulation called Aspen Plus. This program has many useful tools for modeling things like compressors, but it unfortunately does not have any built-in membrane models. Instead, we had to separate excuse me, separately calculate some parameters for the membranes before using them in a simplified separator block in Aspen. We were able to choose many values for the system, including the feed composition and flow rate, the retentate CO2 mole fraction, and the feed and permeate pressures. The feed flow rate was derived from the annual emission of CO2 from the rawhide plant, and other values were based off research that we found. The first two equations here solve for the mole fraction of the CO2 in the permeate Y. The equation on top gives the average CO2 mole fraction between the feed and retentates. The second equation is slightly more complicated and required using the solver function in MATLAB in order to solve for Y. This equation involves the membrane selectivity alpha, which tells us how well the membrane will separate CO2 from N2. Material balances were then used to find any other relevant values needed to put into Aspen. The final equation calculates the area of membrane needed to achieve the desired separation. This allows us to find the cost of the membranes. And this calculation involves the average driving force for separation given by the average pressure difference and the CO2 membrane permeance. The permeance is another membrane parameter which measures how easily the CO2 can move through the membrane. So here is a detailed process flow diagram for our system. Um, this is based on our Aspen model. Um, the main difference from the previous ones that we discussed is that this one also shows the uh, heat exchangers after the compressors. Um, 
Uh, the heat exchangers are used to cool down the extremely, extremely hot flue gas to be a reasonable temperature for the membranes to separate, as well as a reasonable temperature um, that will not damage the membranes from being too hot. Um, we used uh, the membranes we modeled using separation blocks and the separation blocks in Aspen, um, you just use a split fraction to determine how much of each component will go into the streams. Um, and as mentioned earlier, Aspen Plus does not have vacuum pumps. Um, so we just uh, messed with the settings on the compressor in order to give a similar idea. And um, <clears throat> yeah, as you can see here, it also shows our two retentate streams being sent into a mixture to form a total retentate stream, as well as our product stream just being at the end. And that product stream is likely going to some, some form of a storage area for the CO2. This table shows the material balances obtained from our model in Aspen Plus. The material balances are the flow rates and compositions of the streams. Only the important streams are shown here. This includes feed flue gas, both permeates, both retentates, and the final product with combined retentate streams. The flue gas starts hot but is consistently cooled to 40 Celsius so as to not damage the membranes. The pressure is high for the retentate streams and low for the permeate streams in order to maintain a large pressure difference. The flow rates involved here are also very high. The flow rate of the incoming flue gas is 1.4 million kilograms per hour, and the amount of CO2 in the product stream is 190,000 kilograms per hour. In the end, a two-stage membrane system seems to be a feasible method to separate CO2 from a flue gas for a coal-fired power plant. Our design is theoretically capable of capturing about 91% of the CO2 in the flue gas, with the final product having a purity of 89%. The retentates that are being released to the atmosphere also have about 1% CO2 concentration. This is overall just a simple model, but it shows promising potential to keep CO2 emissions from the plant lower. The system would be extremely pricey, as our market analysis shows, with uh, $186 million simply to install the two membranes and an additional $130 million per year of operating expenses on the membrane system. As we can see, the Rawhide plant makes nearly $21 billion of annual average income and spending an additional um, what is that? $316 million um, to make all, basically no extra money currently until a carbon tax is put in place. Uh, this will not exactly save the company any money. It'll only reduce their economic or their uh, environmental emissions. But uh, yeah, this is a feasible design. It could be set up However, it is certainly not a profitable design since there are no um, taxes put into place on the CO2 yet. Since this project only covered the separation of CO2 from the original flue gas, an obvious next step to be taken would be a life cycle assessment in order to examine environmental and economic impacts of the process. Assumptions such as considering the flue gas to be a binary mixture could be improved upon by finding an exact breakdown of the gas and making a more accurate model using this information. We could also add downstream processing to the model to increase CO2 yields. We could do this by either removing the CO2 from the retentate streams or even just increasing the purity of the CO2 in the already product streams. Thank you for listening to our presentation.